I, I left it that way. Good morning. Today's scripture reading will be from Romans 14, 17 through 19. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So let us pursue what makes so let so then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Amen. Amen. This is the first time I have understood the song Kids for Kids. I hadn't figured that out before. I didn't realize the first kids was goats for kids. Kids for kids. How many else just figured that out today besides me? Thank you. Thank you for that deep theological understanding, Paul. That's great. Thank you. Sometimes we sing things and we don't even know what we're singing. So I just thought it was children for children. It's goats for kids. That's what it means. Great. Last week, um, the subject was... Romans 13, 11 and following, 11 through 14. And the text began, do this understanding the present time. And so the things we talk about today are sort of in that umbrella. Do these things understanding the time we are in. You remember, this all started in chapter 12, where Paul took a break from theology, where he had said, all of us are sinners. But God loved all of us so much, no matter who we are, no matter how bad we were, He loved all of us so much, He gave His Son for us, even while we were enemies. And yes, however tall our mountain of sin was, or will become, God's grace is higher than that, and God forgives us all of our sins. And when we ask, okay, then why should I just keep on, why don't I just keep on sinning so God's grace will just keep abounding, uh, the Spirit says, no, don't do that. Don't you know that when you died to sin, when you were baptized into Christ, you died to sin? You were buried with Christ into His death through baptism, and when uh, you were raised from that burial, just like Christ was raised from His burial, uh, to live in a new body, a new life, you are raised to live a new life, not to practice sin anymore. So now we have a new mentality and so that new mentality includes Romans 12 where it says don't be pushed into the mold of the world the world is constantly pushing us into its own mold one thing we can be sure of whatever the mold is today when our kids grow up and they have kids uh, the world will change the mold a little bit and force our kids and grandkids into different kinds of a mold but it'll still be the same world pushing us into a mold don't don't succumb to that make your mind be transformed submit to the Spirit of God let your mind be transformed by the Word of God and understanding that's the world we live in that's the present time we live in a time when the world is pushing us into a mold let everything be done in love let love rule there has never been a more time that I can remember that our world is more polarized between political parties, between conservatives and liberal, between uh, are you on this side and that side, are you for this person or that portion, than right now. We are extremely, extremely polarized. And if you th think it's bad now, wait till the next election and see how much more polarized and how much more misinformation uh, gets said about people. I still love... Uh, we just watched um, the movie uh, a week ago or so, the movie Gifted Hands, which is a story about Ben Carson, uh, the first surgeon to separate uh, little twins joined at the head, I believe. Uh, and so now I've sort of ruined the movie for you because now you know how it ends, but you should still see the movie. <laughs> Uh, but I just love the quote about him during the campaign, and I'm not promoting him for president or anything. I don't even know what, what his deal is, but uh, I think he's head of one of the department's health and something, human services or something. Uh, great job, great person. But anyway, I just remember the quote about him, misinformation that was said about him. Yeah, he's an okay doctor. He's an okay doctor. 
Yeah, <laughs> the first guy to invent a couple of procedures that surgeons are using nowadays. He's an okay doctor, I would say. So all the misinformation, all the polarization, there's never been a time in our world that it's not been more like that. Let love rule. The only problem is that polarization comes into the church. We let polarization come into the church. And so today's text is about that polarization, those differing opinions that exist in the church. So let's let's look at the text uh, in its complete uh, entirety. It's uh, actually chapter Romans, Romans chapter 14, if you want to look in your Bible or on your phone. Uh, but here it is. Uh, this is the English Standard Version. If that's what you want to fall word, word by word, that's what it is. As for the one who is weak, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he can eat anything, while the other person, uh, the weak piece of person, only eats vegetables. Let not the one who eats, this is, this is key, don't let the one who feels unrestricted and permitted to eat, don't let him despise the one who has the rule against eating, the one who abstains from eating. And don't let the one who abstain, the one who is more restrictive, the one who has more rules, don't let that one who has more rules judge the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It's before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld. He will stand, and he'll, he'll stand by the Lord's power. For the Lord is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day is better than another. Here's another illustration. The first illustration was food. Here's an illustration on days. One, one person esteems one day is more special than another. Well, another person esteems all days the same. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The, the one who observes the day, observe it and honor the Lord. The one who eats, eat and honor the Lord. Since it's he who gives thanks to God. While the one who has a rule against eating certain things and abstains, let him abstain and honor the Lord and give thanks to the Lord. What is the problem here? The problem is uh, expressed in two examples. In the first situation, we have a person who eats only vegetables. And we have another person who feels freedom to eat uh, meats. Uh, different kinds of meat. I think that this probably is a resulting issue uh, that comes from Old Testament law. There are some speculations that may be origins about Gentiles and their rules about eating different things, but I think it's probably connected with the Old Testament. The Old Testament had quite a few rules about what kinds of foods and especially meats you could eat. You remember in Acts chapter 10, I believe it is, 10 and 11, uh, Peter receives a vision with this big sheet that comes down with all these different kinds of animals and creatures on it that were prohibited in the Old Testament, that they, those were unclean foods. They were not allowed to eat those. So this sheet is lowered before Peter of these things that are unclean that, that Peter has never tried. He's never eaten before, uh, one of which was pork. And so these animals are on this sheet, and the Spirit of the Lord says, Peter, you kill and eat. And Peter says, no, I'm not going to do that. I've never, I've never done that. I'm not going to do that. It's against his conscience. It's against his conscience that was educated by Old Testament law. So he would not do it. And finally, after three times, uh, uh, God made his point and said, what, what this is really about, Peter, is I have cleansed the Gentiles. The gospel needs to go out now from the Jews to all nations. I've not only cleansed these animals to eat them, I've cleansed all people to be recipients of the gospel. And Cornelius, to whom you are going to preach, is ready to hear the gospel. And, and this is the lesson for you, Peter. I know that before this lesson you wouldn't have walked in Cornelius' house. But now you go to Cornelius' house and you walk in his house and you give him the gospel. Because everybody is a candidate for the gospel of Jesus Christ. So that, that, was the, that was the illustration and that was the lesson. But because of that, in the Christian uh, community in the first century, it's very likely that many Jews still felt like it was wrong to eat certain kind of meats. And maybe some were even vegetarians. And so they had rules. They were very restrictive. They were bringing these opinions from what they had known before. The problem was the church in Rome wasn't very Jewish. 
In fact, um, most of the Jews have gotten run out of Rome. There's a historian named Suetonius who records that Claudius, and Apostle Paul does as well, uh, says that the Jews got uh, told uh, to leave Rome. Actually, it might be Luke, I believe, in the book of Acts, where the Jews were asked to leave or forced out of Rome. And somewhere between the year 49 and 50, or 40-something and 50-something, they were forced out of Rome by an edict of Claudius. Uh, and the reason was because the Christians were having an impact, and that impact was changing the lifestyles of, of people, and people were declaring their allegiance to Jesus Christ. And so Suetonius rec records that these Jews, because of their leader Crestus, Christ, uh, were causing problems in, in culture. And because of that, to the Romans, Jews and Christians are all the same to them. They don't know the difference. They just throw all the Jews out of Rome. Well, for a while. For a while. But then we find some of the Jews back in Rome. A few. But the point is, the church in Rome was mostly Gentiles. Jews were gone. They got kicked out. Mostly Gentiles. And Gentiles didn't have these rules about not eating meats. They ate all kinds of meat. And so when you have a few Jews in a church with Gentiles and have different opinions about what you can eat, there's conflict. One view is very restrictive. The person who only eats vegetables has rules against eating meats. And the person who eats everything is more permissive. And I've tried to avoid the use of terms that are more charged with um, feeling like one is more liberal and one is more conservative. <laughs> Because we already have feelings about those words. Uh, when people accuse me of being conservative, I always say, well, I'm conservative on some things. What's, what's the subject? Uh, but there's some subjects I want to be really liberal on, like generosity, helping the poor. I want to be generous when, when it's an opportunity to help somebody who needs some help. So on some things I want to be liberal, some things, but those, those are terms that are really charged. So let's use, let's use the words restrictive and permissive. Those are sort of less politically charged. So the one who eats vegetables only is more restrictive. This person has more rules. And the, the one who eats meat is more permissive. Now, the other view on, on this one, one person esteems one day as better than the other, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be convinced in his own mind. They also had feast days in the Old Testament, day of Pentecost and other days. And so these days were really special to Jewish people. And so, and, and I think it's actually really good. The church here did a study on feast days of the Old Testament before Nancy and I came. Uh, it was probably about three years ago that that happened. And I have not done that study. I would like to do that study, but I, I have done some study on feast days, and I really, really like the idea of sort of restoring the ideology of those feast days, because those days had meaning. Uh, the day of Pentecost, the day of ingathering, when, when the crops came in, they would get together and they would celebrate that God gave them the crops. The crops came from God, and so the celebration was all about what God was doing. In contrast, our feast days are, are weird. They're different, you know. Um, Halloween, how do you explain Halloween? You know, uh, the Druids back in uh, the early centuries of, uh, of, of, of the period we know, the modern times, uh, after Jesus Christ, or maybe before Jesus Christ, you know, celebrated getting, getting, uh, have, had a party, get rid of evil spirits and stuff like that. And somewhere over the centuries, it becomes Halloween, and and this this is a this is a this is a day of festivity that we celebrate in our country that we don't even know the background of. And it's a fun time. And, and the church where we used to go uh, before moving here uh, over in Escondido, the North County Church of Christ, uh, took advantage of this and would have a big uh, thing in the parking lot and trunk or treat and everybody would decorate their trunks and do a big thing. And, and they would use that to invite guests. Uh, their their uh, facility was right in the middle of downtown, right on the side of Grape Day Park, where the center of town is. And they would use that to really draw people and, and create a, a, a venue that was really healthy and good for the community. They would use it to honor God. And yet other people, <clears throat> mostly the Hispanics, the Hispanic community doesn't know what to do with Halloween. And I'm not sure why it didn't uh, germinate uh, more in Latin America, but it didn't. 
So they, they don't have the, that, uh, that part of their culture that we have. And so the Christians in the, in the Latin American countries where we visited look at Halloween and they say, where did that come from? Okay, and they look at the history back in the first, second, third century. Oh, that came from paganism and, and all of the, you know, witchcraft and all of that stuff. And they're right. That's where it came from, getting rid of evil spirits. <clears throat> so when they do this at the church in North County, the Hispanics would say, why don't we want to honor witches and pagans? And so the Hispanics would say, we can't do that. And I said, fine, don't do that. It's great. And for a couple of years, even the English-speaking part of the church quit doing it just to honor the consciences of the Spanish-speaking people. And then finally, enough of the Spanish-speaking people and their kids said, you know what, we don't know where it came from, but we do like to dress up as, you know, cool things. And so let's do it and just have fun. So they started doing it again. Well, I don't know where you're on Halloween or not. You might be more permissive on that or you might be more restrictive. Some people esteem it as... All days are the same. Other people say, hey, you know, let's uh, dress up in funny costumes and eat candy and uh, have fun. Whatever you feel about that, have that. But that's a problem if you come down hard. Now, if you get really, really technical about this whole where things came from, and you look, for example, at the origins of Christmas, Christmas, the date for Jesus' birth, was not established based on biblical evidence. We know Jesus was born, but we don't know if he was born December 25th. Probably the reason December 25th was chosen was because 20, the 21st of December is the winter solstice. And the Romans already had a big old pagan celebration anyway. And so it was really easy to pick a date close to the winter solstice when everybody was already celebrating paganism anyway. Why don't we put the birth of Jesus there as we Christianize him? And we'll try and move the celebration away from paganism to, to Jesus Christ. Well, the Bible says nothing about celebrating Jesus' birthday in the first place. And so, if you do, great. And if you do it on the 25th, wonderful. If you don't, great. And if you don't uh, ever celebrate Christmas, that's fine too. And that's another issue with Christians in Latin America. They look back to that origin and say, why do we want to be involved with a celebration that's connected with the Romans' view of the winter solstice and paganism and all of that? Uh, well, that's a, that's a good point. That's one way of looking at it. But then you can look at birthdays. Birthdays are not of Christian origin. Birthdays of are pagan origin. Uh, Christians in the first century did not celebrate birthdays. That was a very pagan practice. Christians in the first, second, third century thought that if you celebrated someone's birth, that's, I mean, what do you, do to, have to, what do you have to do to get born? You don't do anything. So there's, what's the celebrate? If you celebrate someone for something that they didn't even, you know, no accomplishment, no virtue in that, they were just born, then you're, then you're giving them a sense of pride that will lift them up and build and make them real heady and proud and arrogant. And Christians didn't want their children to be arrogant. So they didn't give them lots of gifts just for, just for being born. Uh, they, they, they had other views on that. Birthdays came into being much later as a celebration among Christmas. So, so if you celebrate birthdays, great. If you don't, great. What, whatever you think about the day. And so, so that's the problem, is that one person esteems days better than others. Other people esteem all days alike. Well, how does this work for us? There are a lot of different views on things that really are just matters of opinion. For example, here's, here's a more lighthearted one. As you age, see Nancy and I are, are in this bracket. We're having to make this decision. I didn't think about this earlier, but as you age, do you color your hair or not? Yes. yes. Okay. Okay, so, so, you know, that's a big decision when you get in the last quarter of a four-quarter game, you know. So we're in the last quarter, and uh, so our hair is turning white, falling out, whatever. Do we color it or not? Okay, some people say yeah, and some people say no. Some people go both ways, and they do for a while, and then they don't, and then, and then they're shocked, and then they go back to coloring it. And, and so it, as you age, so that's a matter of opinion. Um, do you buy used merchandise from street vendors or swap meets for 10% of its original cost? Guy came up to me in a Home Depot parking lot last year. Hey, I got this TV. Uh, it's a really good TV, a 55-incher. Give me 50 bucks for it. It's yours. 
Would you have bought it? Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Okay, so if you didn't, if you did buy it, you go, wow, what a good deal, man, this is my lucky day. Or if you didn't buy it, you're thinking, okay, it's probably stolen. Uh, so, you know, we have different opinions about that. If someone offers you the opportunity to connect cable TV for five bucks and avoid going through the company, do you go through with it? Ooh, looking at a lot of you are smiling. You're, you're already connected, aren't you? <laughs> That's the way you're getting your cable now. <laughs> we helped a brother move into a house one time and he went to the back of his house and there were these mobile homes off to the, like six or seven mobile homes on his property. And his cable's going everywhere off his cable TV. You know, you know what are you going to do that, about that, brother? And he, he said, we'll figure it out, you know. You got like eight people using one cable TV. Okay, so these are these are opinions. These are these are hard things. Here, here's a really hard one. This was hard hard for for a guy named Bonhoeffer who wrote a book, a lot of books on discipleship. And it'd be good if you read Bonhoeffer on discipleship. But he lived during the time of Adolf Hitler, and he had enough connections with people in high places that it became as as the murders went on of Jews. And this man of God, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, was in a position where he could be part of a plot to assassinate Hitler. And he was faced with the dilemma. Do I become part of this plot to assassinate Hitler?